So this talk is JavaScript can do what? Um, how many people have come for this talk or are interested in this talk? All right, that's a lot of people. I am hope I'll do you proud. Um, now, for myself, um, Brett actually introduced me quite well. I've done over 200 open source JavaScript projects, been a full-time developer since um, 2005, like professional, and then I switched full-time to JavaScript in 2009 and started with Node pretty much as soon as it became public. Um, this talk is going to be a little bit of nostalgia. Um, at the beginning, I'm going to explain how JavaScript came from just interacting with forms to being something that is so powerful um, today. Now it can do amazing things, and by the end, you're going to be quite excited. And we'll talk about the progressions of how it evolved in each different stage, and that'll follow on quite well to Luke's talk about React and, and why React is actually quite important. So I'll just go through briefly the description. Um, we'll go, we did a brief, going to do a brief history of JavaScript, um, talk about the latest ECMAScript standards as well, a short history of Node and why that's important, build tools and generators, we'll touch on that, and browser innovations like WebRTC and browser hindrances, hindrances like the DOM. Now, I do need to know how many people here work with JavaScript full time. Okay, how many people work with JavaScript part-time, like you're back in and you dabble in JavaScript? And how many people don't touch JavaScript at all? All right, so this talk should hopefully be, be quite good for all of you. Um, I'll, it'll be good for beginners, but if you want me to delve deeper into a topic, um, certainly just yell out and I will do so. So we've got the path to JavaScript, and this is the MSN website from 1960. No, 1997. Um, and I'll just pull up briefly the Dalup ringtone. Um, so we have some nostalgia. Dalup. Yeah. Ah. Why is it? I'm using your laptop, Brett. Dalup internet. Tone. All right, here we go. And some people have this on the ringtone for the phone. So while that's connecting to the internet, um, I'll talk about the path to JavaScript. So this is Internet Explorer, one of the very early versions. So in these times, we had JavaScript by Netscape. We also had JScript by Microsoft, which was Microsoft's version of JavaScript. And we also had VBScript by Microsoft, if you still like Visual Basic. Now. In these days, JavaScript was primarily for form interactions. This is a very simple situation where we have a form, it's just got a name, and we want to delete the internet. Um, but we also want to make sure that they do want to delete the internet. So these days, JavaScript being very simple, it will just be an on submit. We'll have like a little JavaScript thing here saying return, and then a window app to validate. And that's gone on to play another song. Um, and there was a namespacing, there wasn't modules in this time, instead we just kind of had a global and then we define our function. And then we would, there wasn't jQuery, there wasn't any libraries like that. So we just got, you know, put an ID on it, got the value. And then if that, if there was no value alert, look, we want the name. But, and then if we do have the name, then we also want to confirm. Now I do have the source for like a full example of this, as well as later on, some of these things will go in a lot more detail. So if you're home and you want to go into the depth about this, you certainly can do so. Now, that was fine, but there's a few problems here, and we can also talk about the solutions. So what, what can people brainstorm as a notable problem with doing validation on the client side? We can interact if you want to. Yeah. I, Right? It, it can be hacked. That, that's certainly one. And there's also another one, which is, what about the server? Like, it can be hacked because there's not validation on the server, right? Um, so, and the other issue is you will have to implement your validation on both sides, right? So you could have validation on the server side saying, hey, is the name also required? So the validation is on both the client side and the back end. 
but maybe you just screw it and you don't have any validation, in which case hacking will certainly be quite an option if you're not having any validation on their client side, or you could even have inconsistent if you don't bother keeping it up to date. So it's a bit of a duplicate effort. So it would be really great if JavaScript could actually talk to the server directly. And this is when we start to move on with our JavaScript and it starts getting a little bit more powerful. Now, in about the, the late 90s, a, a technology came out called XML HTTP request is modernly known as Ajax. Now, it would work kind of like this in terms of our form um, interaction. So we would set up a new XML HTTP request object, would do what happens in the listening. It may have different ways of telling whether it's true or not because of browser differences. We'll pass the actual result. If the passing fails, then we've got an invalid response, throw the error or if the result, the server returned an invalid result because the validation of the server failed, then that's going to be the going to be the thing we want to care. Otherwise, you know, proceed with the success. And just some more basic um, tooling there. Now, the problems with this, I'd imagine, um, could be quite obvious. I kind of gave it away right here, um, but you can still yell it out if you want to. We'll keep this interactive. Otherwise, I may point more at you. Um, but yeah, basically for this one, it's primarily will this work in other browsers? And no, it wouldn't. In these days, the, the browser compatibility issues are way worse. And we really need to start creating compatibility scripts to get this. So for the most basic one for AJAX or XML HTTP requests, this is the way it would actually be done. So we actually invoked ActiveX objects to do that. So it, this was actually a plugin that Microsoft um, did to the web browser. So this is a bit crazy. Now, again, there's problems with this and there's solutions to this. The JavaScript community loves problems and they love solving that. And notably for this one, it's probably going to be, um, does anyone want to try or shall I just keep telling you the, the things right away? All right, maybe that's true. Maybe I'm talking too much. Is that the case? You need longer to think? I don't. I think they've had too many beers, maybe. <laughs> um, anyway, I, I'll just go through, and if you want to jump, jump me and get in there, then you, you can certainly do so. I'm not going to... Not yeah, <laughs> it's not television. That's a good one, Brett. Um, right, so the problems with this is you eventually have to copy and paste a lot of shims um, to do this, right? And this isn't the only thing that needs a shim. Browsing compatibilities are quite high and we need to work around that. But back then, you know, copy and paste was really the best we had. So we just kept copying and pasting all these shims. We would generally just have like a compat.js file that would handle all our compatibilities across the different browsers. But at least then we still have our server side validation. So if we update the previous way of how it would work, now JavaScript has evolved from doing client-side validation and just client-side form interactions to now being able to communicate with the server. And that's, that's one of the big leaps that made JavaScript so powerful and open up the, the new apps that we did. So this is just example one. Um, we now check if there's a, the name, we get the URL from the form, and we send that off via Ajax um, to the server with the data, which is the, I, the data should be an object with the name as a hash. Um, I will fix that when I get home. Now, the function um, goes through and that's just, you know, the callback. So we even had callbacks back in the 90s. It's not a new Node.js thing, uh, <laughs> right? <laughs> now, here we go. Um, so we, if the error happened, we'll show the error in the new error div, right? And if there is an error, we'll submit it again, but this time we'll have the validated true. And there's a few interesting things that are happening here. One is we're actually interacting with this form DOM element. We're inserting new attributes to it. And this would come on to be quite a blessing as well as a curse later on in, in the JavaScript world. But as it is, our, our apps will start getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and it'll probably be time for libraries. So now it's the path to libraries. How did the JavaScript evolve? And there was a few libraries, or noticeably these ones at this beginning, that played a major role in here. We had Prototype as well as Scriptaculous. 
um, which added more effects to prototype. And then we think of it as jQuery UI, but for prototype, we had MooTools and we also had jQuery. Now, prototype was quite great. Now, how many people remember the JavaScript days back then? Is it only me? Great. So for 90% of you, this is going to be fascinating. <laughs> right? So prototype JS was out, and it really was quite interesting um, in terms of it finally allowed us to start innovating in terms of the way we interacted with the website and with the DOM. Generally, this is the way we would have to do it. This is a cross-browser implementation here for adding a class to the element. And, you know, so right now we just want to get my element. We want to add the class pending. And we also set its style sheet display to none. Now, Prototype gave us all of these ways of doing it. Now, there was a longhand version where we would get the element, then we would extend the element's properties and attributes with those bundled with Prototype. So this is generally called monkey patching, which is why there's an angry monkey there sharp firing some things. Now, monkey patching is when you take an existing piece of code and you inject things into it at runtime to alter its um, functionality. And this would go on to be really quite popular in these early days of JavaScript, especially with the prototype movement. Now, there's also a shorthand way of doing it here. So this document get element ID and this extend was just shortened to this dollar sign attribute. These are the days before jQuery, other people are still using the dollar sign. Now, this is where things start getting a bit weird because not only do you require that, but with prototype, with browsers that did support it, they actually overwrote the, um, the, the prototype of the actual DOM element. So how it would work is the, can we, you can't see that bit there. Um, let me get up JS maybe. Oh my gosh. New bin. All right, paste bin. Let's just go there. All right, zoom in. So we have the element type, and we could actually get into its prototype, and we could add new things into here, right? So if we do that, and then if we have an element, document dot get element um, by ID my L, right? Then we could actually do add, right? Um, this is, Ruby is the server-side programming language that I know that this techniques are quite popular with. A more simple example is string.prototype, um, and let's just say yell, right? And if we do then hello.yell, it's going to alert that. So these ways of extending JavaScript were quite powerful and and they're the foundations of what would go on to make JavaScript very powerful. It brought on to the early classes that we now have properly with ECMAScript 6 and onwards, as well as just the way the libraries were able to do and why JavaScript was able to become such an important language in terms of a compile target. You could generally compile any language to JavaScript because of its flexibility and syntax and its runtime. But there are issues here. And you can jump me again. I'm going to keep saying you can jump me. But does anyone know then about the issues with extending native prototypes? Yeah, it's bad and you should never do it. Right. So it is bad and you should never do it. Right? And it's bad. Yes, I'm, I'm going to high five you later for actually jumping in here. Um, so yes, it's bad. And it's bad because what about um, conflicts? What if you have multiple um, shims or multiple libraries that you've included and they argue about what that, that particular method on that native prototype should do? What if a browser compatibility changes of that thing that you're shimming? What will you do? So maybe instead of shimming um, or modifying native prototypes, instead we should just do, provide new APIs. Now, MooTools was then the library that then thought of this and then started taking over. Now, what it did is instead, same thing before, but same deal. Now, it did provide one monkey, one monkey patch to the document, 
and that was to provide this ID function, which is the exact same thing as that. It's just an alias. So one thing over many things, it's still a lot better. But then at the same time, jQuery came out um, just a little bit after MooTools. And it's still crazy because the, the amount of innovation and pace that was happening even then was really cool. So jQuery came out and instead what it did was it didn't actually modify any native prototypes at all, any native classes or bundled classes. And instead it gave us a few things that were really quite innovative. These ones are with the example before, but what it added over the other ones was a really easy way to extend JavaScript and add new abilities and easily share code. Now, a lot of people may have seen the extending jQuery by using $fn, but what they may not actually know what that's doing is it's actually extending the prototype of the jQuery class. And every single time you do one of these, what you're doing is you're instantiating a jQuery class um, with the element in mind. So it's a little bit of magic that jQuery did, but because they were able to hide away the complexity, jQuery really rocketed forward and became incredibly popular. So we have the yell for an element now. Good days. Now, jQuery was fantastic, but an issue arose with it, which, wait. No wonder you're not seeing the problem bits. It's not even shown on the projector. <laughs> that's all right. Now I know why you guys were so hesitant. But anyway, <laughs> that's fine. It's all right. I'll tell you anyway. So yeah, it, it's great for view. It's great for interacting with the DOM, but our apps are starting to get more complicated now. Now, in the early 2000s, what we were having is now instead of just having a form that we need to validate, maybe we have a multi-part form. Maybe when we're editing this large form, we need to be able to track the state of that. We may need to go back and forward using the history, um, using the browser's history. And most notably, these two back and forward buttons, right? And you can even see, like, I, I love this little URL, navigation buttons missing. Now, when you break the state, the navigation buttons may, might as well be missing because it doesn't really matter if, if you have nav navigation buttons but they're not working. Maybe you've got to the fifth part of the form, but now you hit the back button and you've gone to another page and lost everything. And that was actually the reality of the web for the, the most part of last um, century, not last century, last decade, right? Now... There was many things. The JavaScript community is very ambitious and we wanted to solve this problem. We wanted to add more power and we wanted to just solve this because the apps are getting more powerful. Now, I'll go and open up this example here and just show you what one of the crazy hacks we actually did to work around this. Now, there wasn't any native ways of providing state in JavaScript. We didn't really know how to do that. But as you would have all seen, we would have known hashes, right? You can always use hashes for like an um, heading and given an ID and then you can jump to that heading um, by adding the hash to the URL. J GitHub does this all the time for its um, readmes and its markdown files when it's rendered. You can click on a heading and get the link directly to that heading. And that works by using a technique called anchors. Now, it's an anchor when it's here or rather when it's like a... So we would have h1 ID my heading and then my heading, right? That just, there we go. And then if you actually went to my heading, then it would jump to that part of the page. So that's when it's used as anchors. But this part here in the actual URL is called a hash. And what we did was even before browsers supported it, we needed ability of managing state. And one of the ways we did this was we started using JavaScript to solve it. So here we have the state changing. We're changing the URL in the website to slash hash coconuts. Um, you won't be able to see because Safari doesn't like that, but you can see here um, the slash coconuts bit, slash hash slash coconuts. Now, if we hit the back button, we'll notice that it actually changes. Holy cow, we now have state management in JavaScript. But there's a few issues with this, and you've got to be quite good if you know what the issues with this approach was. Um, so I, I'll, I'll save you the trouble of trying to figure that out. But, huh? You can't use anchors. What do you mean you can't use anchors? 
That's definitely one of the issues. Also, the, you can only use up to 2048 bytes of characters in the URL. That's another one. That's also really good. Yep. So this is great. This is when people started in the JavaScript community, and now they're like, I know this stuff, right? <laughs> so that's when you guys have come online um, and started developing. And those things are all fantastic answers, and it's definitely why this was inadequate. Um, so the one the fellow up the back talked about with the URL only being a max length, if you're trying to add a lot of state data into the hashes or into the URL, you would actually have issues. So you had to start doing some hacky type things to try and work around that. And overall, it was really just a big hack. Now, the other issue, which was more subtle to this, right? you wouldn't really notice this if it was a user, but you would notice this if you're the support technician for the web app that implemented this. And specifically, when you're loading um, this, when we hit refresh, right, it's on the state bananas. Now, that's way too quick for you to ever see. Um, because this is a very basic example. But what would happen is it would load the basic website, it would then check the hash, and then would inject the content into the page. So you have two loads here. You have the landing placeholder page, and then you have the more advanced um, one where the JavaScript's kicked in, it's checked the state, and then it's injected the state into the actual website. Now, the next part here um, is because of that initial load and because it required JavaScript to go to the correct state, search engines were out, right? If, and Twitter um, suffered from this quite heavily at one point um, with their implementation, but it was very much that if your state requires some JavaScript, th this is a long time ago and there was many hacks around this, but search engines, they just request the page, get the HTML back from the page and they don't know what's going on, so they just get the landing page. They don't actually get the correct state or the correct page. Now, how the hell do we solve this? Now, you could be Google and you could come out with the hash bang method that was even worse. Um, or you could wait for browsers and yell at browsers to implement the HTML5 history API. Now, I'm not going to go that much into the dem. Actually, no, I will. So I'll show you how it works. But unfortunately, you're not going to be able to see unless I do this. Maybe. Um, I'm going to change your settings here so we can see the URL. Um, where's the setting to see the URL? Do you know? Show full website. There we go. All right, so see we got the URL up the top. I hope everyone can see it. Now, instead of adding stuff onto the end, we can actually modify the URL directly. And this was remarkable. This was completely game-changing at that point in time because no longer would we have to do things where you've got a hash here and then like a slash and we have those issues. Instead, the URL that we're using is the actual correct URL. And this was the time of proper state management. We could even push states, so add new states, and we can replace existing states all while the back button and everything still worked. And we could attach data to those states. So this actually got birth to the way Facebook and Twitter and pretty much all modern web apps actually handle state. This is incredibly important, but again, we had issues back then, which was, what about browser incompatibilities? And that's where one of my projects actually came to get 8,000 stars on GitHub to solve that. Now, eventually browsers would get better, and we started seeing now, we had the techniques and we had the foundations now to build web applications, such as Facebook, such as Twitter. The web was now quite exciting. Now, what was next? Um, in regards to pushing the web forward and pushing JavaScript forward. And one of the main parts into this was templating. Now, this was back in, I think, in 2008. Um, this particular project was published, um, which was allowing you to have templates rendered by JavaScript. Now, this was very early, before the days of Mustache, which is a very popular templating library we most of us may use now. So what this did was instead you could just have your HTML and then you would actually have jQuery or JavaScript render it into something more applicable and you could actually apply template helpers. And it was really quite powerful and you can do a lot with it. So you can check that out later. But again, it was great, but it didn't really solve the issues with datas or, or controllers. 
Um, it gave us great views and great abilities, but we were really requiring more from our apps. We already had jQuery for views. It wasn't that important. But it did come into play incredibly important later. And I don't think there would be a person in the room here who could code a JavaScript app without using templating at some point. Now, to solve this model and the controller aspect, we then innovated some more and we created a project called Backbone.js, the JavaScript community created it. Now, Backbone.js was fantastic for models and controllers. And this is just an example of where JavaScript has evolved, evolved into at this time. So now we could create a message model. We could create messages as a collection and that uses a message model. Now we create a message list um, for a view to render it. We have our element here. For some reason, I've called it page edit. But what this would do is we would grab, grab the element, remove it from the DOM, get the first one. So you got the first um, element for that to actually work. So it removes it from the DOM so you can inject it. A good way of doing backbone. Um, view handling with the initial template. We initialize it, we listen to the model, add a whole bunch of events, but then this is where things start getting complicated in Ori with Backbone. It started making things a lot more tedious. We had a lot of power, but when you started getting into complicated web apps, the, the boilerplate that you had to write was quite intense and it, it just dragged on a lot. And here is messaging a list. Now this would work really well um, for the basic examples. And I'll jump to a little instance of where this will be quite evident. So project to do MVC, a lot of you will probably know of this. Um, a comparison between all the many ways you can do a JavaScript web app. So you can try them out and you can see. Now we can add a whole bunch of list items here. So consider this the message list from our example before. Now we can remove items. So that's probably going to have a listener on the collection. When something is removed from the collection, remove it from the view as well. But then things like sorting came into play and these, and that's not going to be our only list in this application. We're probably gonna have views nested on views, nested on views, nested on views. And one of the interesting things here for that you may not know, this is when JavaScript um, expertise becomes quite necessary, is every single time you do a manipulation to the DOM, um, generally the browser has to repaint. It needs to render the, the DOM again. Now, let's say there's another render, there's another render, there's another render, or rather another paint that the DOM needs to use. Now, if we're now going to remove all of them, generally the way our code will work would be remove, 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 which case you have five or six or however many items you have in there. And then when you sorted it, you're now reinserting it. So you can end up with you know, n times two um, in the O notation for how many paints you need. And it's incredibly slow. Now, if you were good at Backbone, you would realize this, you would do performance optimization. And what you would actually do is you would get the list um, here and da, 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 styles. New display. No. Huh? Oh, we can't actually see the new Ah, damn it. There we go. All right, so I've just added the display none rule. Thanks for that. So that's one paint. And now you can remove all of them from the DOM and then you can inject them all back into the DOM and you have two paints instead of as many paints as you think. And just issues like this became so prevalent in Backbone, we really needed more solutions to this. And of course, more solutions that were, right? <laughs> Now we have so many JavaScript frameworks and application, application frameworks um, to be able to do this and it, it started getting a bit crazy. So instead what we did as the JavaScript community was thinking, hey, can the browser save us again? And the browser vendors actually said, hey, maybe we can save you. And a project called Polymer came out by Google as well as with Mozilla and, and all the other projects, mostly Polymer was led by Google, but the web component spec was led by everybody. And what this promised us to be able to do was actually add all these things we wanted into actual JavaScript and the web 
um, framework itself. So now we have template, but it's actually part of the browser. We don't need to include a library. We can now create custom elements and define them easily. And it really did promise a really nice world. But then one of the issues came up with this, and it, it was quite an annoying issue, which was that if you did run into a problem of performance, you had the issue of now you're dependent on browser vendors to kind of fix it, or you would have to work around browser vendors to try and fix it. And all of the complexity was moved to browsers, and you still had to try and understand that complexity if something went wrong. The same as if you implement a, a JavaScript library and there's something broken or a bug into it, and you have to yell at the maintainers politely as possible, and perhaps with a donation to try and fix it, right? Um, so that became an issue. And essentially, the question was then asked, is it possible to remove the complexity in JavaScript land? Is it possible for us to solve this? And sure enough, sure enough, someone actually thought about this, and it was the Facebook team. Now, this is going to be fantastic. Hopefully, it actually plays. So the Facebook team pretty much said, let's do it our way. And they created React. And the main innovation of React was, there was many. But the main one that I'm going to talk about is the virtual DOM. So what it did was, instead of rendering directly to the DOM, instead you rendered to a virtual instance of the DOM. And this is where things started to get a little bit crazy. This is where a lot of people, for the first year of React being out, people were, ooh, why is there HTML inside my JavaScript? Or they were like, why is there a virtual DOM? Why is this necessary? We have Polymer. We have web components. Right? So anyway, Frank Sinatra, do it my way. Now, which really was the case. They pretty much said, screw you to the, um, the web components and the HTML and the browser vendors way and, and came up with their own virtual DOM for doing that. Now. There's so much involved in here, so I'm going to try and just brush, brush over it quickly. But the complexity of doing views, doing controllers, and doing those things were really quite complicated. Um, so instead, Reactor said, let's do the views, and let's do them in a way that really made sense, or as simple as possible while reducing complexity. And it really did reduce complexity. Now, if we go back to like the to-do MVC situation, right? I'll give you one example of where React could do something better than anyone else actually could. Now, let's say you're going to be sorting a bunch of items. Now, the way you would do this in Backbone is inside your view, you would probably do the sort, and then you would remove everything from the DOM, probably hide that element first for the reasons we already talked about, and inject it all back into the DOM. Incredibly um, required a lot of um, in knowledge of the complexity from the JavaScript developer and the application developer. And it wasn't performant. And you would have to write so much code and be so aware of this. And so many backbone apps that I would have to be involved in or fix would be situations where people implemented the app and they didn't know about these things. And then the app was incredibly slow. And you had to do a lot of work on trying to fix this from the ground up. Now, React, instead, what it did was thinking, hey, let's resort this list, but let's do it in memory inside our virtual DOM. And then instead, with the actual DOM, we'll just apply the changes, the minimal amount of changes we actually needed. So instead of it becoming something where the performance was incredibly complex and quite high, instead the performance became always the same amount, which was that, hey, we're just going to write the changes in one go. And that, that made React incredibly popular to the state of where it is now. Um, now, I do have a, a resource in here that goes into that one point in, incredibly de in incredible detail. That will be in the notes at the end, or if you click on the links in this talk, so you can read up on that. Now, because of the virtual DOM, a year after React's release, they also said, hey, we, we can one-up the, the browsers even more. What about doing targets for our compilation? Because everything was JavaScript, because we had things like preprocessors or transpilers, what about if we could actually write an iOS app or an Android app using entirely React in the virtual DOM using JavaScript and nothing else? So this would actually render to a native um, C, Objective C iOS app. This would actually render to a native um, Java app for Android. 
This was crazy. Before you would always have to do a web view for write apps. Now you have the same stack for everywhere. Now, the, the part here is React was doing everything from the start again. They rewrote, they changed everything. So does that mean you have to change everything too? And unfortunately it does. Um, so for instance, this is the background image here is just one example of a very simple file. Right, this would be an equivalent to maybe that list that I showed you with backbone in a few lines. But instead we have all these modular um, components we need to include. We have to be aware of so much more things because we're now doing all the obligations of the DOM and of other aspects of our app now in JavaScript land, in user land. And these are often many words that you need to know if you're embracing the React world. Now naturally, this, people saw the promise in React and they got burnt out and they got fatigued because they started seeing, hey, it's going to be incredibly performant. Hey, I can write native apps, but it's changing and it's tectonic and or there's tectonic shifts happening all the time um, and there's no real set way. So it's still a complex wild west here. It's, it's kind of like web development 10 years ago or 15 years ago in terms of the React ecosystem, but the promise is incredible. And Luke will probably go more into those abilities too. Now, JavaScript was getting even more powerful. We now can write proper web applications, but then desktop applications started coming out. This is actually some of the notes for my website coded in Javas, coded in Atom by GitHub, which is using web technologies, notably JavaScript, or rather CoffeeScript for GitHub um, to write a web editor that you run natively, not natively, but as a desktop OSX app in the OSX wrapper uh, that can interact with your file system. So it has hooks with Node. So how did that become possible? How could we now use JavaScript to writing desktop apps? Well, Node came out and that was huge. So we can now start writing our own web server. We didn't have to be constrained to using JavaScript with PHP, Python, Java, any other one of these um, back-end technologies. Now we could use JavaScript on the back-end and a front-end. And finally, JavaScript was properly unleashed from the browser to now the desktop and other areas as well. So the main instance here is this would hook into C++ bindings and give it you know, abilities that any C program you could do, you can now do in the Node world because Node could communicate with C and communicate with your operating system quite well. So we create a web server and we listen. Now the other interesting thing, there's two interesting points in this. That's why I even have amazing in here as a comment. So piping became incredibly popular and Node was selected for this because Ryan Dow thought, how can I upload a file to a web server well? And he ended up thinking the JavaScript event system is the best way of doing this. And for the JavaScript event system, it's what you use to listen to a button on a web page. You click the button, JavaScript's constantly going in a loop saying, hey, is there anything for me to do? You click the button and event fires and then it says, hey, there is something for you to do and it does it. So, and it can sleep in the background. So it gave you the ability of threading without the complexity of threading. It allowed you to do multiple things at the same time without really thinking about it and without the corruption of memory issues that you would generally ha have with normal threading. So for instance, this is reading a pipe, uh, reading a file and then piping it over, sending it over in the background to the actual response. So if someone went to this web server, they would actually get the contents of whichever file that we have here sent over to them. And this web server, whenever there's a new request, it just pings the function every single time that function fires and it pipes all that stuff off in the background. Now in PHP, it's a synchronous environment, right? You can only do one thing at a time with PHP unless you spawn other PHP instances. But with JavaScript, um, with the event system and then specifically with Node, we can now write web service and interact with the file system in a way that gave us the ability of threading, but without having to worry about it. We're now able to do multiple things at the same time, interacting with the, the desktop environment and had the ability of piping and whatnot. Important stuff. But new platform, new foundations, what could, how could we develop this into something that was amazing? NPM came out about a year later. Um, it wasn't around in the initial versions of Node. It was 0 0.6.13 um, of Node that bundled NPM for the first time. Those are actually other package managers. This made it incredibly easy to publish new modules 
this is a multiply one, you could do this as a package and then include it. And it uses the common JS standard, which is now replaced just generally by Node to be able to require packages. We now had the ability to share code in the JavaScript world that wasn't just downloading a zip file, right? And then extracting that zip file's contents. And that was crazy that that saw huge, huge adoption. And now there's more than 200,000 packages on NPM. And it did explode, and we have all of these new innovations. Now, we have Browserify for being able to write um, JavaScript on the, that will run on the server and then compile it to run on the browser as well, packages up very neatly. We have Grunt for compiling web apps or just any type of project, so like a task runner, and Gulp was a very similar implementation than, than as Grunt. We had Express for doing web service and implementing middlewares. We had Meteor that allowed bi-directional communication between the client and the backend. We had Babel for compiling the latest ECMAScript standards. We have Chainy here that could interact with data in a chainable API and very simply. Docpad is my own one and that was the first prominent static site generator for Node.js and that got a lot of adoption quite quickly. Um, and we have that one is Electron, which allowed you to wrap JavaScript, wrap web apps in a native desktop app environment, such as Adam used earlier, Yoman for generating web apps, Mocha for testing, Primus for communicating via WebSockets, Johnny5 for interacting with robotics. Um, I clicked that. Keystone, which is a CMS developed by guys in Sydney, um, and probably girls, if I want to be explicit about which genders I, I'm including here. And we have CoffeeScript as well, one of the first popular um, languages that could compile to JavaScript. And we even had crazy things like this were now possible thanks to Node. Right, so I'm connected to the cloud with HTTP. Is, uh, if I can tell it to spin around. So this is a drone actually being powered by Node.js using the Johnny5 framework. And that's actually controlled right now in this example by voice, using the Google Voice APIs. This fellow, Dominic Tarr from New Zealand, um, what has he done? Uh, facial recognition. Um, James Halliday is the one in the beanie. So this was James Halliday's experiment here. <laughs> and this was just a hackathon over a weekend. So you'll see the little circle there picking up, not a face, but it does pick up a face and it works quite beautifully. <laughs> we have a helmet here. So that circle around the face shows that it was actually working. They hooked it up to a game controller instead, um, powering the game controller as well, using Johnny5 for the hardware interactions and using Node. Um, we even programmed in the Konami code um, that does double flips. And so uh, enjoy. This is the new style of gaming that we like to interact. Uh, what are you seeing here? Uh, so that was in 2012 using Node, and it's gone a lot further and a lot 
more awesome um, ever since. And it's continued to grow and get more popular. And it's because of all those innovations that have happened over since JavaScript's invention that allowed things like that to become possible. So we started now seeing, and this is only like last year, really modern web applications or just modern applications now because they're not necessarily inside the web browser. We have one for editing games right now built with web technologies. We have a one which is like Netflix, but it uses torrents. So we now have a torrenting client implementing JavaScript using WebRTC to communicate and seed things to each other. And you can imagine that being on YouTube. Instead, you could have the video cache towards your browser's cache and then stream to other people near you um, without your knowledge um, to, to speed up the website. Um, so it's like a CDN, but it, it's peer um, and distributed. And we have, of course, Slack. That is another example of this. Now, what were the innovations here that were able to make that possible? We had content editable. So by just adding the content editable attribute to a DOM element, we can now actually start editing it without a text area. We can now modify it and do amazing things. Why is this not working? But that was working. But a more complicated example, a more thorough example is this one. Hello. So using content editable, your website, and you're now actually able to edit it. So whatever's rendered in HTML, now you can render it. And that's amazing. But there's still problems with that. There's compatibility issues, um, different standard selections, all the APIs around it. And there's a lot of innovation into that. The Medium editor, if you've used Medium for blogging, uses content editable. WebSockets were another innovation, allowing before we had XHR Ajax to communicate from the client to the server um, so we could get information from send like a one-off thing. But we didn't have a way of the server to notify the client if something just happened randomly. So for instance, someone edits something and we want to see that change in real time. WebSockets came in. Before that, we actually hacked Ajax to poll it all the time and just say, hey, is anything happening? But then WebSockets came out and actually allowed the server to talk to us directly. Great innovation there. And that was led by the JavaScript. Well, led by the, the, you know, the browser vendors as well, but really requested and implemented because of the needs of the JavaScript community. Um, Primus is a great library for that. Socket.io was another one. WebRTC, able to start using JavaScript now to hook into your webcam. And of course, this is one of the things that is a problem about WebRTC because every single browser supports it except Safari. Hopefully this year. So this is JavaScript actually requesting my webcam. This is, this is important. If I can find my thing. And that's all that code. That example where I put up my webcam, that's it. That's all the code. Now, it can even get crazier, right? WebRTC allows you to communicate with your webcam, with your audio, just and even with your screen in modern things. So you can do screen sharing. Uh, Max Ocean, the one who looked like a Viking in the the, the drone thing, um, he was a big innovator in this and developing apps um, around WebRTC, or rather. Um, little nifty apps rather than the WebRTC standard. So he created one called ScreenCat with another person called by the username Maffintosh. I'm not sure what his actual name is or her actual name is. Um, so that was really cool. And that could actually do peer connections, right? So we could do CDNs and torrenting um, inside the browser. ECMAScript next. So classes now actually became feasible. On the left hand, we had how we did classes before um, JavaScript supported them correctly. Really crazy, but that's what we had to do. JavaScript did support classes, but with a lot of hackery. Now with ECMAScript 6, this is actually implemented in the latest V8 and in the latest IE, and I think in also um, the latest Firefox, it actually supports classes like this. And that's, that's, that's fantastic, and there's going to be a lot more stuff which you can follow the links to. Now, that's the end of the talk. You can get the link um, to the talk here, more resources here. That's my website um, there. And I'm also experimenting with different teaching. If you want to learn JavaScript, if you thought I'm actually an okay speaker and would like to hear me dribble on some more, 
um, that's you can reach out to me and I'm happy to teach or teach you as an individual or as a student. And I'm also happy to train your company with JavaScript and WebRTC and Node.js. Now, if this little link here, just for follow-up resources, if you want to know how I personally and my community of JavaScript developers for the open source world get started with these technologies, that's the website and the project. But primarily, the one you want to listen to now or know is that link. All right, that's it for me.